Good morning, First Baptist Church of Gray Gables. Uh, I hope you all are having a wonderful week. Uh, So thankful for you tuning in here this morning. Uh, Just a couple of announcements. Uh, If you haven't got your 2021 phone directories yet and you'd like that delivered to you, please call the office. You're always as well welcome to come and pick that up. Uh, as well as your offering envelopes for 2021. We've got Christmas cards still as well. If 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 there's something here that you need that we can bring to you, uh, please call the office, let us know. Call myself or Pastor Justin. We'd be happy to get that uh, to you. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with us last week. We were a little bit late uh, producing the, the service. We, uh, it is my fault. I was on vacation and didn't get back in time. So you can write all your angry letters uh, towards me. Uh, but we did miss you and miss this time we had together. Um, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in, you'll probably notice on YouTube or on the website that we've been in 1 Thessalonians for actually a while. It was, it's been about seven months with some breaks, obviously, uh, but we're currently at verses 9 through 12. And so if you want to open up your Bibles with me, and I encourage you to do so, I'll be reading that passage. And as, as you turn there, let me remind you, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, a church that he has personally evangelized as recorded in Acts chapter 17. His missionary trip there was brief because he was thrown out of the city. Uh, He was only there about six to eight weeks. So this is a young church that has been, as he said, orphaned. He had to leave prematurely. He was not able to give them all the instructions that he wanted to give them. So he left or he sent Timothy. And after hearing their report back from Timothy, Paul writes this letter to this church in Thessalonica to commend them for the report he's received from Timothy and to strengthen them in the faith. That's what he's been doing for the majority of this letter. He's just turned to the beginning now of chapter 4 to begin to exhort them specifically toward holiness. That is to live lives that are set apart unto God. Generally, to walk in a manner worthy uh, of the gospel and to please God in all that they do. Specifically, as we looked at last week, to call them to sexual purity as they live. This week, he calls them to brotherly love. So that's where we're at. Go ahead and take your Bibles, open them up with me, and let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Here's what the precious, inerrant, infallible word of God says. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack Nothing. First Baptist Church of Gray Gables, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's go to the Lord and thank him for his word. Gracious Father, we thank you for we know that you are here with us this morning. Lord, we are thankful for our glorious salvation. Our salvation truly is a miraculous thing. From the work of your son who accomplished and enabled it to the work of your spirit who has applied it. So Father, we honor you today and we celebrate our salvation. We ask now that you would open our eyes and ears as we consider your word. Would you cause your people to hear this word that it might be rightly applied? Father, if there's one here listening that does not yet know you in Christ, we pray, Father, that they would hear the gospel proclaim and they would know your presence here among us, that they would cry out and seek the forgiveness of sins. Father, we do thank you, and we pray all this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so the big idea I have before us this morning that's found in verses 9 through 12 of 1 Thessalonians is this. Love your church family by working your hands, not your mouth. I could probably say it in in a better way, but I think that's what we're going to go with uh, as the big idea. Love your church family by working your hands, not your mouth, if I can put it like that. 
And I hope by the end that you will see that this is an appropriate summary of what Paul is saying here in verses 9 through 12. Love your church family by working your hands, not your mouth. Simple, right? Well, let's go ahead and go through the passage verse by verse and see how Paul communicates to the church in Thessalonica this big idea. See, the big overarching issue here is brotherly love. Paul writes at the beginning, but concerning brotherly love. This is the subject matter that he's going to take up uh, in, this, in these verses. Now, the word translated brotherly love is Philadelphia. It's where we get the name of the city for brotherly love. It's been in the past compared or contrasted to agape love, which is unconditional love, unconditional love versus brotherly love. But that distinction is really not fair because the reason Paul uses brotherly love here in this context is because, as most of you know who have been listening along with us, he's been focusing on this familial relationship that is now a characteristic of this new covenant community in Thessalonica. Rich and poor, barbarian Greek, Roman Jew, woman, man, all now brought together in a new community and they have become brother and sister. People who before would never have rela related to one another have now entered into the most intimate of relationships, this community that they are a part of. It's, a, it's even transcended their familial earthly relationships. And so Paul now begins to address this issue with the Thessalonians with a commendation of their love for one another. He starts by addressing this issue with a commendation of their love for one another. Paul writes, he says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. You have no need for anyone to write to you about brotherly love. And then he's gonna give them two reasons why this is the case. Two reasons why they have no need for anyone to teach them about brotherly love. And the first of those two reasons is this. They had been taught by God. They had been taught by God. You see that in the second half of verse 9. He says, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Now the Greek term that is translated taught by God, it's actually a very interesting word. It appears that, that Paul coined it. It is nowhere used in Greek literature before. It, it, it's used now here in this letter. Paul makes up this term to communicate how the Thessalonians are taught by God as opposed to a term that was common in Greek, which is to be self-taught. See, the Epicureans and the philosophers of the day used to talk about how important it was to be self-taught, to have the wisdom of men. But the Thessalonians, the believers in Thessalonica, they are not self-taught, but God-taught. It also seems that Paul's alluding to Isaiah 54, 13 here, where he says, all your children shall be taught by the Lord. That's a very important verse. Isaiah 54, 13, it says, all your children shall be taught by the Lord by God. See, the context of Isaiah 54 is God's promise of an eternal covenant with his people, an eternal uh, brotherly love covenant of peace. See, God will instruct each and every one of these new members of this eternal covenant of peace. In fact, this is not even the first time in Isaiah that this covenant, peace, uh, covenant of peace is promised or the, the fact that God will teach them is promised. In Isaiah chapter 2, uh, verses 2 through 3, it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days uh, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. Uh, and, and, be, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. Here, Paul, knowing the Old Testament backwards and forwards, says, this is true of you. This is what has now happened. God's eternal covenant of peace has now been established through the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Thessalonians have been taught by God. Jesus himself even actually quotes Isaiah 54, 13. He does. He, he quotes Isaiah 54, 13 in John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45, where he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught 
by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Well, here in this context, Jesus actually uses it in regards to regeneration. He uses it in the sense that only those who have been drawn by the Father to Christ belong to God are those who are taught by God. Now, hear me. Uh, Does that therefore mean that as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, no one needs any more instruction? That one doesn't need any more instruction after they've become a believer. Is that what Paul is telling the Thessalonians? That they actually don't need to be instructed by Paul or anyone else because God has instructed them himself? No. The Thessalonians still had to be taught to observe all that Christ had commanded the apostles. Uh, But don't miss what Paul's point is. Their observance of Paul's instructions and the apostolic teaching more generally, it was not because of the teaching of Paul. It wasn't because Paul was some incredible teacher and able to motivate them. It was because of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonians had not simply been taught by Paul, but through God himself in the presence of his spirit. So now by virtue of their union in Christ and with Christ uh, in the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, these Christians were taught, enabled, and caused to walk in brotherly love towards one another and toward all in Macedonia. The result is that they actually loved one another. And that love was demonstrated by their actions, which now gives us the second reason why Paul said you have no need of anyone to write to you. And that is they were demonstrating this brotherly love toward all the believers in Macedonia. They were demonstrating the love that Paul is commending them on toward all in Macedonia. He says, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. Just as, if you remember back in chapter 4, verse 1, that the Thessalonians were already walking in a manner that pleased God, likewise, Paul writes here, and indeed you do so. And indeed you do so. In fact, this is the second of three times that Paul is going to make a similar statement, that the Thessalonians in general are already doing something that Paul had instructed them to do. Again, giving evidence of their circumcision of heart, giving evidence that they had been indwelt by the Holy Spirit and were being caused to walk in a manner that pleased the Lord. Uh, Not only are they demonstrating this mutually brotherly love towards one another, but they're demonstrating this love now to all Christians throughout the whole of Macedonia. How were they demonstrating this love? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul doesn't really tell us explicitly what form their demonstration of love took in this text. Uh, Some commentators believe Paul is referring to the hospitality that was extended to the Macedonians as they were traveling through Thessalonica. Some commentators believe that Paul is referring to personal or financial provision for missions specifically. And while both of those are possible, and certainly, um, certainly uh, both, there's probably some truth to both of those in some way, most likely what's implied in the context here is economic help for Christians that were struggling uh, in economic distress. Economic aid for needy Christians. Paul says these Thessalonians were bearing evidence, giving evidence to the love produced by the Holy Spirit through their generous giving to these impoverished Christians. So those are the two reasons why Paul says you have no need of anyone to write to you concerning brotherly love because they had been God taught and they were demonstrating they had been God taught through their love for one another and their love throughout all, to all believers throughout all Macedonia. But apparently they still needed to be taught something because that's exactly what Paul launches into next. And the way he's going to do this, he gives them really an appeal formula that we talked about a couple weeks ago. But really what he's going to do is give them this one broad exhortation and then a couple of smaller exhortations that are going to be spelling out this broad exhortation, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So what is this big broad exhortation that he's going to give them? The broad exhortation is that they do so more and more. That the Thessalonians increase in their love. Increase their brotherly love. The Thessalonians uh, were encouraged to demonstrate again and again in ever increasing ways their love for one another and for all believers throughout Macedonia. He says, 
But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Now, the next couple exhortations, again, are going to spell out this broad exhortation more specifically. And the first of those smaller exhortations is actually two, but we're going to put them into one. And it is this, to live quietly and mind your own business. That's right, folks. That is in the Bible. Live quietly and mind your own business. If I could paraphrase it, I would say, don't be a disruption. Don't be a loud mouth meddler. That's what he says in the text. He says that you also aspire to lead a quiet life to mind your own business. See, these two are closely related. They're separate exhortations, but they really belong together. To aspire to lead a quiet life or to live quietly, that is live in such a way as to not purposely disturb or offend those around you and to mind your own business. It's an encouragement to avoid meddling. Now, whether inside or outside the church, there is much debate in the commentaries whether Paul is referring here to an inter-community struggle or strife that he is addressing, or whether he's referring to outside the community, whether this is between Christian and fellow citizen in Thessalonica. Most commentators, a vast majority, believe that because of the way Paul uses the verb that is translated uh, to lead a quiet life, that he's referring to Christians and those fellow citizens outside the church in Thessalonica. That there were some uh, who were out in everybody else's business doing all sorts of stuff, and they were bringing uh, the type of tension of attention to the church that the church doesn't want. In fact, I want you to hear what Philo, who was a first century Alexandrian Hellenistic Jewish philosopher, I want you to hear how he describes the opposite of those who lead a quiet life. He's going to give us the contrast of what it looks like to lead a quiet life. He says uh, this. He describes the contrast of this as a vulgar man who spends his days meddling, running around in public in theaters and tribunals, councils and assemblies, meeting and consultations of all sorts. He prattles on without moderation, fruitless to no end. He confuses and stirs up everything, mingling truth with falsehood, the spoken with the unspoken, the private with the public, the sacred with the profane, the serious with the ridiculous, not having learning to remain quiet, which is the same word that Paul used in our text, which is the ideal when the situation calls for it, and he pricks up his ears in an excess of bustling busyness. And so most commentators believe Paul's exhortation uh, to lead a quiet life and mind your own business was prompted by a conflict between those in the church and those outside the church that they were disturbing or purposely offending. I think Jeffrey Wyman nails it perfectly when he writes this. He writes, to maintain a low profile in the public uh, arena, keep to themselves as much as possible, And practice Philadelphia within the church, thereby minimizing the danger of arousing further opposition to the Christian movement. In other words, hear this. Paul exhorted them to aspire to live peaceful, inoffensive lives that demonstrated respect and honor towards others in and out of the church. I mean, after all, this is the essence of love, right? Love does no wrong to a neighbor, And church, hear me, I'm convinced that if I had a single exhortation right now in our culture that I were to broadcast to every single church in America, it would be this right here. If I could preach one sermon, hear me, that is saying a lot. If I could preach one, I think I would preach this passage right here. Because I know this isn't all that appealing. But this message needs to be heard. I mean, how many times have you been encouraged encouraged from the pulpit to aspire to live quietly and mind your own business? Or just in general, even from Christian literature? Is that the call we most often get? On the other hand, how many times have you been encouraged from the pulpit that what we need to do is change this or that institution to just get out there and make something happen? How many times have you heard that message? Now, I'm, I'm not in any way, shape, or form trying to create a false dichotomy here by attempting to say that what Paul is telling you or telling the Thessalonians is that they don't need to be out evangelizing and they don't need to be out trying to impact the culture with Christian values. That is not at all what I'm saying. 
In fact, we have dedicated a lot of Wednesday nights to just how we need to counter the culture. That's not Paul's point here. But Paul is making a point here. And I think it's a point that we need to hear in light of what I see as a big problem in the American church today. And that is, we are full of a bunch of loudmouth meddlers. I mean, we can say that it's part of what it means to be American, right? Uh, we are full of loudmouth meddlers. Not only that, we've begun to esteem loudmouth meddlers as if they're the pinnacle of Christian holiness. As if that's what it means to be holy. If you're out there debating anyone and everyone and sometimes even the most abrasive, purposefully rude and disturbing, of, disturbingly offensive ways that you're somehow a hero or champion of the faith. Or if you're out there and you, you're trying to overtake the culture, by the way, you're trying to do it in your own strength. You're trying to overtake this kingdom of darkness and make it into a kingdom of light. Never mind being transferred from the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. People are responding to that. So what I'll try to do is try to transform their kingdom into a kingdom of light. That way they don't have to move. And I don't get it, friends. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that what you should do is not evangelize. It's not what I'm saying at all. But I do think what I'm saying is, is don't put purposely offensive and abrasive things on Facebook and call it evangelism. That's what I'm saying. That's my conviction. Listen, church family, we all need to be prepared to give a witness to the hope that is found within us in Christ. Every one of us ought to be prepared to give a defense of the hope, to share the gospel, to share the testimony that we have this hope. But remember, our lives individually and corporately should testify to that hope, not contradict it. So we should pray for, vote for, and responsibly advocate for biblical values. But do not forget, our language and conduct should actually demonstrate those values, not undermine them. So we aspire to, to gain the respect of outsiders so that uh, when we are ready or we've built a relationship or those who are ready to evangelize them or actually are able to do something that makes a change in the culture that their critics can't point out to all the craziness we're spilling over every available media outlet and say, see, look at that, Christianity is a sham, these people are nuts. See, so the reality is, as I see it, if you take all the verses explicitly or implicitly that command us to go out and engage the culture and do X, Y, and Z, and you stack them up against all the verses that just explicitly, not even counting implicitly, but explicitly command or exhort us to holiness, there is no comparison. So why is the emphasis always on engaging and overtaking and there's so little emphasis on holy love? living in the midst of a covenant community listen the burden of every letter that Paul writes is the culture of the church not the Greco-Roman culture the church's witness as the eschatological community as the people of God and so before you go and tell your neighbor about the love of Jesus Remove your ranting and raving on Facebook and mind your own business. And, and hear me, friends, the point of this is the gospel's offensive enough. If you tell somebody that, uh, that they are a sinner, that they're standing right now in the wrath and judgment of God and they have perfectly earned that and they are in desperate need of a savior, it's offensive enough. You don't need to purposely add any more offense to that. You need to lead a life of humility, of quietness, so that when you share the gospel, it is shared loud. <laughs> See, the second exhortation we're going to look at that helps us unpack this need for brotherly love increasing more and more is this. Not only are we to lead a quiet life and mind your own business, but we are to keep yourself busy, provide for yourself, and do not be a burden. Keep yourself busy, provide for yourself, and do not be a burden. Look at what Paul writes, continuing on in our text. 
He says, and to work with your own hands. Remember, Paul had set an example in this. In 1 Thessalonians 2.9, he says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And in fact, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul is even more emphatically and explicitly going to tell them this when he writes this, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because uh, we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you. So Paul wrote again at verse 10 of that same text, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. As Dr. Wyma again states, he says, Paul calls on his readers to be self-supporting and contributing members of the church, the very thing that he himself has done during his mission-founding work in their midst. See, the circumstances that, I guess, provoked this exhortation uh, it seems to be pretty clearly the willingness of some to live off the generosity and kindness of others. And hear me, friends, nowhere in the scriptures is that prohibited, or is that, uh, is that encouraged. Everywhere in the scriptures, it's prohibited. You are not to live off the generosity and kindness of others alone. In fact, even the Old Testament, think about it. Uh, Israel was, was told a lot about how they were to care for the poor, and they were to care for the poor. But remember, according to God's law, how they were to care for the poor. They were to leave them the fields for harvest, They were not to harvest the grain, make the bread, and then give them the food to eat. They were to enable them to work, to make room for them, to make sure that they were cared for. Now, obviously, Paul's exhortation here to work with your own hands is not aimed at elderly widows or those who are handicapped in any way, shape, or form, those who have no opportunity to work. Paul is speaking to those who could work, therefore they should work. The idleness of some of the members of the church of Thessalonica was problematic. First, we are just, as we discussed above, their idleness was giving them opportunity to go about all over Thessalonica and stir up trouble. So instead of going out and stirring up all kinds of trouble, work. Go get a job. <laughs> But their idleness also caused others to have to provide for them. And so they were actually taking advantage of those who were working. But ultimately it caused a problem because they obviously had a wrong theology of work. They didn't understand that work is good in and of itself. Even if it is in this present age. We were created to work. Adam was created to, among other things, work and keep the garden that God had placed them in. And so hear me, if you remove a person from their labor, you are actually removing part of their purpose. You are stealing something very important to them. You are removing them uh, from part, a healthy part of their identity, and you are denying them dignity as a human being created in the image of God to work within the God context that God has placed them in. I mean, you know there's going to be work in the new heavens and new earth, right? It's not going to be just sitting back on beach chairs, throwing back whatever it is you throw back. There's going to be labor, and it is going to be good, glorious, and beautiful, Our work in this age should actually reflect that eschatological hope. Did you hear me? A proper theology of work actually motivates us to work, not just so that we can make ends meet, but because we recognize that we were created to work and work is good. Whatever you do, do it unto the glory of God. So Paul exhorts them to work with their own hands, just as Paul and his companions had instructed them to do. And then he's going to go into the reason for this. Paul is going to finish out by providing two reasons here for obeying these exhortations. Two reasons for obeying these exhortations. What are they? Look at verse 12. That you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. That's his first reason. You, th- those are two reasons, and they're pretty clear, right? We can, we can dis- dissect this hermeneutically pretty easily. Let's look at the first reason. The first reason Paul gives is so that the Thessalonians might win the respect of non-Christians. 
that the Thessalonians might win the respect of non-Christians. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that they should give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Or Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, he wrote, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Do you hear that? One of Paul's primary concerns in all the churches is that the believers would live quietly, mind their own business, so that they could gain the respect of outsiders, that they might be a testimony to the truthfulness of the proclamation of the gospel. This isn't about people pleasing, it's about pleasing God. We are not to be known as a contentious people. We are not to be known as a obnoxious people. We are not to scream over the noise of the culture so that we can be heard. If you keep in mind the larger context here, you'll notice that Paul is pointing out another boundary marker. Holiness. This is the context. See, the outsiders will know the insiders. Those set apart because the outsiders will recognize that those insiders aren't loudmouth meddlers. That's the goal. They are holy The second and last reason is to be dependent on no one. Be dependent on no one. Hear me now. This cannot be understood as the goal of autonomy or complete self-sufficiency. It's not what Paul is saying here. You would have to ignore most of what Paul has said up until now to interpret it that way. Paul just commended their demonstration of fraternal love throughout all of Macedonia. This demonstration was an example of great dependence and interconnectedness and would make little sense if Paul turned here and say, actually, never mind, you guys should just strive to be independent toward one another. Paul was instead saying that obeying these exhortations would fulfill the goal and purpose of greater personal responsibility. That's what Paul is calling them to. Don't want others to do what you can do for yourself. Don't take advantage of those who are kind and generous. Don't stir up trouble for the new covenant community. By taking responsibility for yourself and keeping yourself out of trouble, you actually demonstrate your love for your brother. See, it's so easy to take a passage like this and go through it verse by verse like we just did here to hear these exhortations but hear them removed from the greater context of 1 Thessalonians. Because the greater context of 1 Thessalonians is the gospel itself. The reality is that we have seen how Paul alludes to the new covenant promises that have now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ in regards to the Thessalonians. We have seen that from the very beginning, Paul is writing to a group of people who he says are loved by God, that God has chosen them because the gospel came to them in power in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. So you take a passage and you preach through it and you can hear all these exhortations, but God forbid we actually divorce those exhortations from the gospel itself. The call to live a quiet life and to mind your own business, to work with your hands is grounded in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Let me say this. There is no exhortation you find in Scripture that Christ did not fulfill for you already. Did Christ not live a quiet life? You really don't hear much about Jesus until the beginning of his ministry. And you know how old he was when he began his ministry? 30 years old. You don't hear about his political campaigns and his attempt to alleviate all suffering and hunger in the world leading up to his turning into a preacher of the gospel. He lived a quiet life. In John 6, when the throngs want to take him by force and make him king of his kingdom, of this world, what does he do? He says, oh man, about time you guys recognize who I am. Now let's go, let's take this kingdom. No, he departs from them. He separates himself from them. Matthew chapter 12. Look at Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 15 through 21 here. Look at what this very important text tells us. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. And many followed him. And he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. 
Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with my soul, is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name the Gentiles will hope. Listen, I I know Jesus made noise many times. I know that. He cleansed the temple. But overall, Jesus lived a quiet life, all things considered. He also minded his own business, did he not? And what was his business? He says in John 5, he came not to do his own will, but the work of his father, to live a perfect life on behalf of sinful people, to fulfill the whole law for his people. And at the end of his life, to receive in himself the curse that our sins had merited. The judgment that we deserve to be raised on the third day and to be seated at the right hand of the Father, even now, where he does the work that he is called to do, interceding on behalf of his people. What about working with his own hands? Well, most agree that Jesus was most likely a carpenter. He did manual labor, but more importantly, at the end of his life, when he merited all the blessings of the kingdom of heaven, he took those same hands and he spread them upon a cross to receive in himself our penalty, the wrath of God upon himself. These exhortations to live quietly and mind your own affairs, to work with our hands, void of those gospel truths is moralism. So you can live quietly as you want. You can be as anti-meddling as you want. You mind your own affairs as much as you want. You can be very laborious, but if you don't know Christ, if you're not trusting in him alone for salvation, if you've not turned from the way you used to live and are following him, then you have missed the whole point. And so that's our prayer today. Not simply that that you and your own strength would just aspire to these things, but because in Christ we have all the promises, yes and amen in him, that we strive to live in his strength, that we strive towards holiness because of his spirit's work in our lives. And this is describing what holiness looks like. So do you have this holiness? Are you striving for this holiness? Does this mark you as a Christian? Is this what you're striving for? Are you resting the fact that Jesus has already accomplished this on your behalf? And therefore, because of his grace, because of his strengthening, saving, and now sanctifying grace, you're striving for holiness in this way? My prayer is that you are. Would you pray with me? Gracious Father, Lord, you know the hearts of your people better than we do. You know that especially in our day and age, many of us, myself included, struggle with living quietly, with minding our own business, with being good stewards of the work that you have given us. Father, I ask for forgiveness on behalf of your people where we failed Father, I pray that you'd help us, especially even now in the midst of everything we're going through, that we would value that quiet life more, that we would value those who faithfully and quietly follow your son, Jesus Christ, encouraging and praying for those who've been called to proclaim and articulate the gospel to a culture that is dark and dying. And Father, I pray that we would keep ever before us the life and work of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that we would never divorce the imperatives and exhortations of scripture from those gospel truths that compel us. The love you've demonstrated through your son, our love, would you cause it to mirror that love more and more? We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Church, the invitation is clear. Um, Maybe... These things don't mark you as a person in any way, shape, or form. Um, and, and maybe there's a, there's a struggle there. Remember we talked about last week, it's okay to struggle and fight with these things, but we fight. Um, this is part of what it means to be holy. And so maybe you just have some sin that you need to confess, especially in this time. I know this week I've had so many sins of not minding my own business and, and, and being a loudmouth meddler, and I can excuse it however I want. Um, But at times during this week, I was just so convicted over my need for Christ and my need to lead a quiet life and to mind my own business. And so if that's you and you just want to confess or want a brother or sister to talk to, please reach out to us and we would do that ourselves or let you know somebody that you can talk to that would uh, be comfortable with you. And and friends, uh, maybe you never heard today that Jesus has accomplished uh, 
um, all that we need uh, in himself for our salvation and you need to trust in him by faith. It's very simple. All you need to do is call out to Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to save you, to show you mercy, to confess that you are a sinner in need of his grace, to believe in what he has done on the cross that is enough uh, for you and to accomplish your salvation and then to trust in those things and not in your own self and uh, as you go on throughout the rest of this life. That's all you need to do. And if you've done that in any way, shape, or form, uh, please let us know uh, so we can pray for you and encourage you and point you uh, to godly people who can disciple you and love you and walk with you through this Christian life. Church family, I miss you guys. Um, I love you so much. Please reach out and let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Uh, Go and be blessed. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you. We love you.